January 1943, French Morocco. President Roosevelt arrived for the important Casablanca conference. Prime Minister Churchill and the President were making far-reaching military decisions. With the combined chiefs of staff, they planned global operations. Generals Marshall and Arnold had to build up the United Kingdom base in the face of Nazi plans to infest the Atlantic with submarines. Remembering how their U-boats in 1917 had brought England to her knees, enemy leaders were proud of their 1943 plans for a network of sub-pens. Dr. Tote's engineers now built them with 12-foot concrete tops to make the U-boat nest safe from the Allies' heaviest bombs. The enemy had launched a monstrous U-boat program. 300 by 1942, 900 by 1944. This was to be ruthless undersea warfare, masterminded by Admiral Carl Dunitz. Back in the United States, our new fighters like the P-47s were being shipped to England. Fighter aircraft had become so vital in the war against the Axis, they were given high priorities. Because of the submarine menace, Allied navies escorted all convoys. By torpedoing the freighters, the enemy tried to cut our Lend-Lease lifeline. Killer subs roaming the North Atlantic in the first half of 1942 had sunk 506 Allied ships. Threatened was the security of Great Britain and our build-up for the air war in Europe. Victorious German submarines were organized in wolf packs. Confronted with this desperate emergency, the U.S. Navy called on the Army Air Forces to assist them in the fight. Our long-range depth bomb carrying B-24s were the answer. The ultimate workhorse of our counterattack on the U-boats was the radar-equipped Liberator. These land-based planes were matched against a sneaking killer. The enemy operated almost unimpeded along the vital shipping lanes. Plenty of good hunting. First for them, but after May 1943, for us. Most of us in the 1st Bomber Command and later in the 25 squadrons of the Anti-Submarine Command patrolled wide areas ahead of the convoys. On the deck, we searched immense stretches of the Atlantic hunting for Nazi periscopes. were clearing the North Atlantic of the Nazi U-boat threat. In those summer months of 1943, the anti-submarine command of the Army Air Forces did a vital job. American fighter planes and badly needed supplies got through. But in the Far East, on another front, supplies were only trickling through. General Arnold and Allied Brass faced the fact that General Chenault's 14th Air Force had to be supplied. Some of his bomber operations had almost ceased. Following Casablanca decisions, Arnold ordered General Bissell to help the ATC India-China wing increase the airlift over the Himalayas. We called it flying the hump. Here over Calcutta, India, we got an idea of how much our sky wagons were slated to carry. There was plenty. Tons of food and medicine. Tons of gasoline and bombs. Shiploads of them every day. Even this was only a fraction of what would come. First, while still crated, supplies moved overland by train, due north about 800 miles. This was the slow part of the long journey. Then, near the border of Tibet, our supplies were parceled out to several airfields, like Chabwa, largest of the hump terminals. Here, too, although there was plenty of manpower, the transfer methods were primitive. Until more ordnance equipment arrived, the natives helped fight the war with their bare hands. Some of these bombs weighed half a ton. After a year of operation by the 10th Air Force, 
we had grown from a squadron of 10 borrowed transports to a fleet of 140 high altitude C-46s and 47s. By 1943, Hump Commander General Edward Alexander began to set records for troops, supplies and equipment being lifted over the hump. Stretching before us were 500 miles of rough duty. Before it was over, the treacherous hump had cost us 250 transports, 250 cargoes, and 800 airmen. A high price to pay for the privilege to fly over the highest mountains in the world. We flew continuously, some of the time through Jap fighters and treacherous weather. The clouds made pretty pictures, but at 20,000 feet they could mean ice and death. No emergency landing fields among saw-toothed five-mile-high peaks for us aerial truck drivers. Flying without fighter cover, it was always good to hear we were on the beam and minutes from landing at Kunming, China. In December of 1943, the India-China wing carried slightly over 6,000 tons. Before the war's end, ATC had airlifted more than one million tons of supplies and one million troops over the hump. With the help of Army Airways' communication system, flights eventually averaged one plane every minute and a half. Peak airlift was reached in July 1945. 71,000 tons in one month, including a fleet of jeeps. Every four tons of gasoline delivered used three and a half tons to get them there. Despite the hazards and hardships, despite the costs, the Army Air Forces had conquered the hump. Up our way, in the dismal and dreary Aleutian Islands off Alaska, it was a different sort of war. Around us was the deep, spongy tundra of dead grass and muck. Over us, fog, sleet and rain for days on end. In spite of it, our 11th Air Force under General Bruce Butler not only protected Alaska from Jap advance, but also struck offensive blows at the enemy. We had a single fighter group of 100 planes, including P-38s. Our force was built around a handful of pilots experienced in Alaskan flying. Colonel Jack Chenault, son of the 14th Air Force commander, led a fighter squadron. Our strength at this time for the entire Alaska Aleutian area was only 226 operational planes. Luck was with us. On 8 April, the weather cleared and we set out to crush the nip thrust at Atu, most distant of the island chain. We also helped to box in Kiska, the second enemy-held island, forcing the Japanese to withdraw. From flooded fields, we waded into the enemy. Our small air force was guarding the northern approach to America. In the Pacific, the word went out. General Nathan Twining and his crew were lost on a routine flight. We set up everything that could fly, but the South Pacific had thousands of miles of ocean. Chances of finding the commanding general of the 13th Air Force were slim. Then, on the morning of January 31st, five days and six nights after ditching, two rubber rafts were sighted. Now the question was, how many had survived exposure in the Coral Sea? The search plane radioed the base. Immediately, two Navy Catalina flying boats were ordered out to make contact with the search planes, which directed them to the rafts. After being fished out of the drink, the survivors were rushed back to the nearest base where medical aid awaited them. Although cramped for 130 hours in the small rafts with very little food and hardly any water, their morale stayed high, thanks to General Twining. All 15 aboard the lost B-17 had survived a rugged experience. Twining and his crew were part of a small army of men whose lives had been saved by the air-sea rescue services of the Army and Navy. 
General Twining rejoined our theater commander, General Millard Harmon, in planning new operations up the Solomon Island. Had fresh B-24s, and in July, were able to launch our 37-day campaign to Jap-held Munda Field on New Georgia Island. Some of us had taken off from Hard One Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, which American men had bought and paid for with their lives. The blow we were about to deliver to Munda, we hoped would make their sacrifices worthwhile. We were finally nearing the island. As soon as we made our approaches to Munda, jungle hopping medium bombers went after the Jap air drum and its defenses. opened up. Stubbornly, the enemy held on until 171 aircraft dropped 145 tons of bombs in a half hour. It was the heaviest air bombardment yet cooked up in the South Pacific in one day. By the time resistance had ended, the enemy had lost 350 aircraft. In only nine days, the Allies rushed the strip into operating condition. P-40s were the first to land, followed by heavy bombers which could easily be carried on the coral runways. Warhawks helped protect the base as we rapidly built it into a key for the Solomon Islands. In a few weeks, traffic exceeded that of any field in the South Pacific reaching the peak of 564 aircraft in one day. The Munda campaign had shown the success of a new tactic, bypassing heavily defended enemy points and gaining air superiority behind them. General MacArthur described the island hopping campaign as a series of battles for airfields. In the South Pacific, as elsewhere in all global operations, the Allies had proved the might of air power. Air power had helped clear submarines from the Atlantic. Air power had conquered the hump. Air power had made Pacific Island hopping possible. Later chapters will show these daring tactics applied to smashing the Axis itself as more men and weapons were added to the mighty arsenal. 1943, Army Air Force graduation exercises at Tyndall Field, Florida. From the start, France and 30 other allied nations sent many of their airmen to the United States to learn how to fly, to fire a gun, or check an engine. In fact, the Air Training Command used about one-third of its facilities for this program to help build the United Nations Air Team. As one product of the AAF educational effort, which developed into the greatest training program in all history, French cadet Henri Chevalier was awarded gunner's wings. Pilot wings went to another cadet whose entire class was destined to join the Chinese-American composite wing of the 14th Air Force under the command of General Claire Chenault. And so the young men from Great Britain, Netherlands, East Indies, Central and South America, by graduating in the United States and by fighting in Europe and Asia, demonstrated the Army Air Force's unique contribution to the total war effort of the United Nations. Of the 475 training command bases we had, the Officer Candidate School of the AAF at Miami Beach, Florida, was devoted to turning out administrative officers. We wanted men from every walk of life who could handle responsibilities. By the end of 1943, we knew the AAF was going to have more than 158,000 planes and more than two million specialists around the world. Only 23 out of every thousand applicants were finally chosen as candidates. Meet the cream of the crop. The man on the left was the national intercollegiate high jump champ. The one on the right served under Chenault in China with the American Volunteer Group. Elmer E. Meadows was once the world's champion pole vaulter. He won the 1936 Olympic title in Berlin. The fellow on the left was rescued off Corregidor. The other a symphony conductor. D.R. Delano, fifth cousin to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. A trapeze artist with Ringling Brothers Circus. 
On the right, the mayor of Glen Cove, Long Island. This former Austrian attorney spent quite a while in a Nazi concentration camp. A gunner with the RAF and a Broadway playwright. Gilbert Rowland of Hollywood. He used to have a mustache, remember? These men wore the order of the Purple Heart. One got his at Pearl Harbor, the other in the Battle of Verdun. Robert Maservi. You knew him as Robert Preston. Two Tigers, one from Burma, a member of the Flying Tigers, on the right, catcher for the Detroit Tigers. This man was cited for bravery at Pearl Harbor. First bombardier to touch Midway, Wake, and Guam. Right, the AAU light heavyweight champion. William H. Jordan, bombardier in the Battle of Midway. Those medals are for sharpshooting. The fellow with glasses was an ecologist. He worked for the United States Department of Agriculture. For 14 years, he had done research with a sugar beet leafhopper. In fact, he knew more about the sugar beet leafhopper than anyone else in the world. The other fellow was a champion high jumper. Because Hap Arnold knew that Hitler wouldn't wait for us to build a ground officer's school, he had General Weaver lease 300 Miami Beach hotels and we were in business almost at once. In hotels like the governor, we housed our students. Better than a tent, but no vacation. We gave each prospective officer a reliable chambermaid, himself. No wrinkles in those beds, blankets tight enough to bounce a coin. Shoes shined and lined up, dresser drawers staggered and open. Socks rolled, personal articles arranged according to student order. Student orders, the Bible, no dust in this room. Bed made like the book says, we allowed them seven hours sleep. They were lucky if they managed five. They studied instead. Each man's clothes were hung in the same order. All buttons were buttoned, each and every button. No drop of water in sink or tub. All bright work polished, highly polished. So were the men, all spit and polished, and their spirit was high. During the 12 weeks, they crammed in enough schoolwork to equal a year at college. In concentrated education, they studied chemical warfare, air and naval intelligence, administration, aircraft identification, mess management, supply, military law, and 27 more subjects. At West Point, many of these courses took a year of study, but America was at war. After improving their minds, we improved their bodies. This was all part of the Air Force X-ray machine that revealed washouts as well as leaders. Graduation. Everyone came out for the show. The guest speaker was the old man himself, General Hap Arnold. He flew down from Washington just to address the class. That was quite an honor. Today, the cream of the crop had a right to be proud. This cross section of America had been through something, and they had made the grade. After three grueling months, they earned that commission in the Army of the United States. For a few of the men, there were special honors. A sense of achievement. Some won awards for sports. But every graduate now had poise and confidence. OCS turned out leaders of men who could share the nation's responsibilities. For many, the oath marked the start of a new career in the service of the nation. But in spite of the joy of the graduation moment, the Air Force would have been nothing without the devotion, anger, and bitter pride of the great American people engaged in a war for freedom. Love and pride were as much a part of the Air Force as money and planes. Now, after a desperate year and a half of war, 
the AAF was about to fulfill an historic and decisive mission. In another part of the world, on the Mediterranean, plans for Operation Corkscrew moved ahead as the British 1st Division convoys prepared to embark from ports in Africa for Pantelleria. The island, with underground hangars and natural defenses, was regarded by Mussolini as the Italian Gibraltar. General Jimmy Doolittle warned his men that conquest of the volcanic rock might prove expensive. The enemy had 900 planes within range and 80 major gun emplacements on the island. Briefings for 9th Air Force fighter pilots, now attached to the Northwest African Tactical Force, were carefully guided by General Lewis Brereton. The all-out air attack on the island had been recommended by his boss, General Carl Spots. For Operation Corkscrew, the brass gave us slightly more than a thousand fighting planes of every type. They felt our combined air forces had at last grown to a point where we could chance the first Allied attempt to conquer enemy territory, essentially by air action. According to plan, for 18 continuous days during the first phase of the campaign, we had battered the fascist fortress with heavy raids. Photo Recon reported that our work was effective. Mussolini's Gibraltar was now set up for the knockout punch. In a couple of weeks, our boys in the Northwest African Air Forces were changing the concepts of war. From African bases, where American air power had achieved co-equal status with land power, phase two of Operation Corkscrew got underway on 6 June. As our heavies joined the show, the plan called for an around-the-clock assault to continue with growing intensity for five more days. The Allied command was about to unleash the full force of its air power. In all, 1,100 planes were participating in today's climactic assault. They were prepared to drop 1,571 tons of bombs. That meant better than 23 tons of destruction per acre. High on the target list were Pantelleria's shore batteries. we had dropped almost 5,000 tons of high explosives, achieving a concentration on military objectives greater than any we had ever attempted. Twice, the island was offered a chance to surrender. When Pantelleria showed no sign of quitting, B-17s were ordered to resume the bombing. It was then that our plane spotted a white flag flying from Semaphore Hill. Allied air forces had bombed the island into submission. As a result, the invasion fleet met practically no opposition. Regarding the operation, a British Joint Committee reported, in effect, active resistance on Pantelleria had ceased when our amphibious forces arrived. Not a Tommy or a GI got his feet wet. From here on, it was a routine operation. Immediately, the Allies began to prepare the island for its part in the invasion of Sicily. For the second time, Axis might was reduced to rubble, and strutting supermen became beggars with surrender flags. Troops quickly poured ashore. They were amazed at the extent of the destruction. 
the remains of the enemy's air defense was strewn along the beaches, while the only landing casualty was a British infantryman who was nipped by a local jackass. By the time of the Sicilian campaign, Pantelleria had become a full-fledged Allied air base. The Allies could now place a strong defensive air arm over the Sicilian Narrows. The sea route from Gibraltar to Alexandria could be kept open. Operation Corkscrew not only paid dividends, but because it proved the power of air bombardment to force a defended area to capitulate, it was destined to become a military classic in the history of the United States Air Force. Dawn, August 17th, 1943, England. On the first anniversary of their operations against Fortress Europe, the 8th Bomber Command prepared 376 B-17s for the two most critical targets on their list, the ball bearing plants at Schweinfurt and the Messerschmitt Aircraft Factory at Regensburg, both deep in Germany. What an anniversary. Just a year ago, we flew that first mission to Rouen. 12 B-17s flying 56 miles to target. Now, we were taking 376 fortresses 500 miles into Germany. Never had we prepared for so rough a mission. In 1943, the AAF was still growing up. The Luftwaffe had already reached its peak. But our boys taking their battle folders knew it. By the time we turned in our personal stuff, it was well understood that the projected doubleheader would bring on a large-scale and costly air battle. In chapels all over England, most of the men turned to their ministers, rabbis, or priests. Getting into the trucks, we didn't dream that August 17th was being written into air history. Not only because of us, there were other soldiers in the skies. This was the same day that Sicily fell to the Allies. The same day that the RAF bombed Pinamunda, the V-2 rocket plant. The same day that General Kenny's B-25s destroyed 200 Jap planes at Weewak in eight minutes. And this day, our double mission involved the deepest penetration ever attempted into Germany and the largest bomber force to be dispatched to date. We knew that as we went further into Germany, we'd hurt her more. But we also knew we'd have to pay a higher price for admission. And now the last briefing as the pilots recheck the details of the mission with their crews. Individuals no longer existed. We were now 10-man teams, and on our teamwork would depend our success and perhaps our lives. Action against Schweinfurt got underway. The Regensburg task forces had just hit their target. A vast and intricate machine of destruction had been set in motion. Behind these modern warriors were weeks of high command planning. Now, crewmen took care of routine duties. Ahead of us were four hours of rugged action. Our guns were going to be especially important today. At the briefing, they told us we'd have help from short-range fighters and eight their support mediums. The fighters were supposed to take us about halfway. The mediums were to bomb diversionary targets. But for the worst part of the trip, we'd be on our own. Finally, after a few hours delay due to bad weather, 2,300 men counted the seconds.
fires had never been stopped. Although German defenses had stiffened, American formations had not been prevented from reaching their objectives once they responded to the green takeoff signal. As always, each thundering run was an epic of suspense until 30 tons of bombs, plane, and men were lifted from the earth. The leader of the first wing, Colonel William Gross, swept in a huge circle around the field. Gradually, the second and third bombers edged into position. The sky quickly filled with stately fortresses sliding through space. But as soon as they got into formation over the British fields, they were picked up by German radar. Across the channel, the tentacles of the enemy's locator system, having touched the flying fortresses, now pinpointed them in space. Luftwaffe experts accurately plotted the American course, altitude, and speed, and promptly informed their fighter control. Immediately at dozens of Nazi airdromes from as far north as Denmark to down around Paris, German fighter units began to send up everything they had. Their order was intercept and destroy the oncoming fortresses. The answer to the increasing Allied bomber offensive was this stepped up German fighter strength. Waves of opposition screamed off the map of Europe. In spite of the Luftwaffe, Allied planners selected our targets according to Allied Air Force priorities. That's why, merely three hours after the fourth bomb wing had paralyzed the Nazis' Messerschmitt factory at Regensburg, we in the first bomb wing were on our way to strike Schweinfurt in the face of an aroused enemy. As we began to run into flak, our gunners could feel the entire German air force warming up. Flying in enemy territory, we felt like goldfish in a bowl, waiting for the attack. Strict radio silence was maintained while trained eyes searched the sky. Jerry knocked 20 bombers out of the sky on the road to Schweinfurt. We never broke formation. Despite the ferocity of the attack, which extended all the way to and from the target, we pressed forward. Our guns kept burning the enemy out of the sky. Approaching the bomb run began the most critical defensive period. Now we divided into smaller groups, sacrificing our mutual defensive firepower to bomb the target most efficiently. The crucial moment, the moment around which the entire mission revolved, was now in the steady hands of our bombardiers. Each bomber was now committed. No more evasive action until bombs away. At this time, the formations were most vulnerable to attack. The 
didn't matter. We had a job to do on Schweinfurt. We had 400 tons of high explosives to deliver. on the two main ball-bearing plants, we could defend ourselves again, at least to the extent of evasive action against flak and fighter attack. But the main idea now is to get home fast. At the British landing fields, word on the sky battle was out. Red flares were expected. That meant wounded aboard. These planes had priority in landing. Many of the fortresses themselves were crippled. A few came in with feathered props or with knocked out landing gear. After struggling home at housetop altitude, one B-17 with wounded aboard was committed to a crash landing. ship was my prayer. The anniversary battles lost us more men and aircraft in a single day than the 8th Bomber Command had lost in our first six months of operations over Europe. We who carried the war 500 miles to the enemy's industrial heart knew better than anyone how expensive it was. We had lost 60 bombers and their crews. happened this 17th day of August, year 1943, was a testament to American men with modern weapons and a very old idea, fighting for freedom. On this day, high-altitude bombers engaged in their greatest and, from the point of view of loss, their most disastrous air battle to date. Nonetheless, the results justified the price we paid. Out of these trials by fire, there did emerge from the struggle one of the most polished and powerful instruments of warfare ever assembled. This force of men and planes, this accumulation of skill and experience, became the power and might of the United States Air Force. Nineteen forty-three, Burma. Two years after Pearl Harbor, General Joseph Stilwell opened his long-delayed campaign for a ground supply route to China. With a handful of Americans and American-equipped Chinese divisions, he was advancing to meet the Japanese Imperial Army and drive them out of Burma. Stilwell had molded the once pulpy mass of ill-fed peasant soldiers into skilled top fighters, able to meet the Japanese on equal terms. But this Allied penetration, named Operation Saucy, was unusually difficult. The men had to fight the Japs and the disease-infested jungle in order to stay alive. As a transport pilot, my job was to fly help to Vinegar Joe's army. He was entirely dependent on our 10th Air Force for ammo and medicine, clothing and food. Stillwell's men marked their drop zones as they inched steadily closer to Jap positions. The progress of an army depended on a co-pilot's signal. General Stratemeyer had warned the Pentagon, the only way we can supply any force that advances into Burma is by airdrop. That's why when Stilwell started this offensive southward from Lido, he had air supply for his advancing troops. Our supply pushers developed bombsite precision. 
For the past year, split-second timing had meant survival to lonely air-warning outposts perched on jungle-covered ridges in the Naga Hills. Air supply and the successful teamwork of the Eastern Air Command now made it possible for the Burma campaign to drive ahead. But in the jungle, the mission that the Joint Chiefs of Staff had given General Stilwell was one of the toughest in the war. He had a most difficult physical problem of great distances, almost impassable terrain. Cutting their own trail, Stilwell's army stumbled along at barely a mile an hour. The Chinese jockeyed for a frontal position, flanked by other Allied forces. It was a two-pronged drive to split the Jap wedge and reopen the Burma Road. The advance by the Chinese army into the Hukong Valley was the most ambitious campaign yet staged on the end of a thin airborne supply line. With amazing vigor, Stilwell carried on. Wounded men, the enemy, and the jungle were his obstacles. Quick evacuation of casualties could hasten the campaign, cut it down to months instead of years. But how can you get a wounded man out of the jungle fast? In the CBI, a plane we call the Sky Jeep was the answer. It was both a light transport and an ambulance. Able to operate from temporary airfields, we achieved a high degree of mobility and secrecy. In one month, 10 sergeant-driven Sky Jeeps carried out more than 700 casualties. With one of Stilwell's wounded soldiers aboard, the last chance got ready for takeoff. campaign made full use of air power, from transports and bombers to an armada of sky jeeps. Upwards of 100,000 men were constantly supplied and evacuated by air. Eventually, the Allies were able to drive the enemy out of Burma. Down at Allied bases south of New Guinea's Owen Stanley Mountains, another army of men and planes prepared for the first Allied paratroop drop in the Pacific. It was designed to cut off a large force of Japs at Nadzab in northeast New Guinea. Early in the morning of 5 September, 1,700 sky jumpers in full battle array climbed aboard a fleet of General George Kenney's 5th Air Force transports. At 0825 hours, the first C-47s rolled down the runway. Within 15 minutes, three flights totaling 79 planes took off. In all, 302 aircraft slid into place and, like a mighty procession, paraded toward Nadzab. The pilots gradually dropped from altitudes of 3,500 feet down to 500 feet. So far, no trace of the enemy, but no chances were being taken. A squadron of low-flying attack bombers laid columns of smoke on the floor of the Nadzab Valley. Once over the target area, the transports formed into three columns, each with 32 planes. The 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment and a battalion of Australians tumbled out to make their first drop, and with success. Nadzab, the Jap's back door, was left open. With Allied forces firmly installed in northeast New Guinea and the Solomons, General MacArthur and Admiral Halsey could now threaten Rabaul the enemy's main supply center in this critical area. For three days in a row, we were alerted for a strong, low-level attack to knock out Rabaul on New Britain Island. At forward staging bases in New Guinea, our B-25s waited for weather as we got ready. We were going to depend on our gunners to neutralize enemy planes in Akak in order for the rest of us to smash the airdromes around Rabaul and then destroy the concentration of military shipping in Simpson Harbor. Ever since January 1942, units of the 5th Air Force had continually blasted Rabaul. Today, November 2nd, 1943, the briefing officer announced that the 8th Photo Squad flying recon over Simpson Harbor 
had seen seven destroyers and 20 merchant vessels. At the airdromes, they had counted 237 planes. This sounded like a rough mission. At the fighter pilot briefings, P-38 boys were given details of the plan that required perfect coordination between bomber and fighter elements. Surprise and timing were the main springs of the battle plan that the successful air campaigner General Kenney now put in motion. Briefings over, five squadrons of Mitchells, a force of 80 medium bombers, were boarded and revved up. Shortly after 10 hundred hours, the tower gave them the go-ahead and the bombers got underway. fighters got ready. From six squadrons of lightnings, two squadrons had orders to sweep Simpson Harbor, four to flank the land batteries. In all, 80 lightnings scrambled off. held their formations as we headed toward Rabaul. Leader of our shipping strike forces was a veteran of 80 strafing missions, 25-year-old attack group commander Major John Hennebury. Once over the Solomon Sea, the Kenny plan went into high gear. As we scanned the skies, we spotted what we were looking for, enemy aircraft. Our lightning swept in ahead of the bombers to clear the area. When two zeros challenged Captain Ralph Bilge and his wingman, he opened up. First, Bilge didn't connect, so he got his 38 on the Jap's tail, and the battle turned into a chase. Our lightnings ran into more than 60 interceptors. The P-38 escort, led by Major Gerald Johnson and Captain Richard Bong, flew interference with the anti-aircraft neutralizing forces. They attacked swiftly and with a double intent of covering the B-25s and destroying the enemy. Our surprise visit gave the Jap pilots at Lacuna Airdrome short warning before the speedy P-38s peeled off and dropped their bombs. We dove in on aircraft, parked on hard stands and revetments. Three minutes later, four bombardment squadrons approached the target area. Assigned to neutralize shore anti-aircraft positions, the B-25s peeled off. bombs because of their delayed explosions permitted us to get down low and blast the enemy out of their hiding places. It was this complete neutralization which finally enabled our striking forces to make dangerous mass tie runs over Simpson Harbor.
Rabaul this day, we bombed 24 enemy ships. We scraped 17. Our bombers destroyed 52 enemy aircraft. Our fighters claimed 42 shot out of the sky. The cost, 45 American flyers, 17 American planes. In the space of 12 minutes, a formidable Japanese sea and air armada was attacked and decisively defeated. After two years of war, the Japanese strategic plan had been fatally upset. But the Allies knew the enemy was not yet destroyed. Her armies and navy still controlled conquered territory. General Arnold told the world, there are many roads that lead right to Tokyo, and we're not going to neglect any of them. Relentlessly, the Allied attack had to continue, spearheaded by the striking power of the United States Air Force.